السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعد It's your brother Yahya Ibrahim joining you live with Islami Q&A through the wonderful vehicle of Islam Channel. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes our gathering a gathering of rahmah, of contentment, of peace, and of comfort as we gather together seeking his pleasure and his mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are, mashallah, progressing through the wonderful month of Shawwal, the month after the blessed month of Ramadan. Allahumma taqabbal shahru Ramadan aminna. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from all of us our blessed month of Ramadan, that it is a month that leaves behind a legacy of the rahmah of Allah azza wa jal and increase in our taqwa, awareness and consciousness of our dealings of our maker and creator, that we are those who are more connected with our families and loved ones and those that we love in his path and in his way on account of our joined uh, seeking of his mercy and pleasure, Allahumma ameen. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's gathered us from our different places, gather our hearts and souls and our time uh, in these moments, me coming to you live from Perth, Western Australia, from my home here, to wherever you are in the world, that we are gathered again together in the company of our Nabi Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Over the last two weeks, alhamdulillah, we had an opportunity to answer a number of your questions, and we always began it with a short discussion. And as you're ringing through and as you're making your way through the queue to get your questions on air live with us, I hope, inshallah, that we can speak about something that is invigorating, not just to my sense of iman and my increasement in my faithfulness to Allah, but also that can be something of benefit to you, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you and I from those who are fortunate and that we are of those who grow our iman. One of the powerful surahs in the Quran is Surah Al-Anfal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, very early on, about halfway through the first page, he says, That those who are true believers, those who are really true in their faithfulness, that they are those who, when the remembrance of Allah is made, whether it is the prayer that they perform and they hear the Qur'an being recited, or the remembrance of Allah in the form of reading of the Qur'an, or just something that reminds them of their servitude and their worship of Allah, that the Qur'an affects their heart. It makes their heart shudder and in awe of the majesty of Allah, of the, uh, of the power of Allah, and of our need of Him. Alhamdulillah, we have a caller already with us. We will come back to that theme of what are the things that grow our faith. Our first caller, Assalamu alaikum caller, how can we help? to the adhkar, there are a number of different adhkar that are given to us through the tradition of the Prophet And one of the things that I think is really important is that within our tradition, there isn't the attempt to gather all of the adhkar in any one evening. So one of the things that you will actually have some of the ulama have taught their students is to pace their adhkar that there will be adhkar that they will make on one particular day 
And it's perhaps that they shift to another type of adhkar or another level of adhkar or another mention of other dhikr on another day. So what I would say to you is that same concept would be true, that if you had made a particular dhikr after your Salat al-Maghrib, maybe in your place of prayer or wherever it may be, and you have passed through that dhikr, if it is something that is meaningful for you, so for example, there's some adhkar that are wiping away of sins. There are some adhkar that are increasing of rizq. Just say there's something that in, in your particular moment in life, there's a need for that particular dhikr. For example, Alhamdulillah alladhi afani. I am thankful to Allah and I'm praising to Allah who has favored me and protected me from something they have tested somebody else with. Perhaps you received a call, somebody's falling sick or something. So that dhikr that we always make each and every night, Alhamdulillah alladhi afani mimma abtala bi ghayri fadlani ala kathira min ibadi, that dua, now it's something more meaningful. So yes, I would encourage you to repeat it, inshallah, in the next revolution, in the next time that you're saying it before you go to sleep. But if you are able to make a new thing, something that maybe you are not accustomed to making in that part of the evening, and maybe you open your Hisnul Muslim or another one of the dua books, then rotate your dhikr. And that was taught to us by the Prophet ﷺ. I'm going to leave you with this hadith, this word of instruction given by the Prophet ﷺ to one of his wives. So the Prophet saw his wife sitting at her place of prayer after she finished salah. So he went out, came back a few hours later, sa'at, and he found that she was still sitting in the same place making her dhikr. And he asked her, have you, radiallahu anhu alayhi salatu wasalam, have you been sitting in the same place since the morning after your fajr until now, and now the sun has risen? And she said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said, I said three, I said four sentences three times that earned more reward than all of the dhikr you made in this moment. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, adada khalqihi, wa rida nafsihi, wa zina ta'arshihi, wa midada kalimati. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, adada khalqihi, wa rida nafsihi, wa zina ta'arshihi, wa midada kalimati. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, adada khalqihi, wa rida nafsihi, as I just said that, the Prophet said that that was greater than the amount of the morning dhikr that was spent. So there are certain dhikr that have a great deal of power, a great deal of influence and something that we can alternate. But yes, it is valid for you to repeat the same thing in another occasion, inshallah. I believe our sister had another question that she had. Assalamu alaikum. We have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum. We have a caller with us. Assalamu alaikum. Next question. Next question. Next question. Yes, sister. How can I help with the question? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Sir. Uh, I'm coming regarding that. When we pray, yeah? Sorry, you, you broke out just a little bit. Can you repeat that question? Thank you. Yeah, so I'm coming regarding that. When we pray, yeah? Like, when we pray, yeah? Like, when we pray, yeah? Like, Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, it's very upset because I've got it. But there's this uh, shake, I'm not going to say that the secretary is that it's supposed to be going off of it for the place that says that they drag their head on the floor, that's why they have it. And uh, that's very, very wrong. I don't want to wait back. A shake of the caliber will be sent like that. Like, like, Okay. All right. I th I, I, although your car was, uh, call was breaking out, I did understand the context of your question. So uh, I, I, the question is about the place of prayer. That for some people, that they, they may have a darkened spot on their forehead from making their sujood. For other people, they may have dark parts on their knuckle from rising up. For some people, they have a little bit of a mark on their knees or on the places that are in contact with the floor. We know in the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that when we make sujood, it's upon seven bones. The forehead and jabin, the forehead and the nose, the palms of the hand, the knees, and the instep, of the ball of our toes, the inside part, the undercarriage of our feet. Now, those are the seven parts that are meant to be in contact with the floor. 
I want you to know, sister, that there are some ulama who used to condemn upon their students trying to bring that mark out of um, excessive uh, uh, striking of the ground. So for some people, if you are using a carpet or a sajada that is rough or that you haven't moisturized or the sun was hot on a particular day and a lot of people, when they go to Hajj, they return with it. They think it's because their Hajj is accepted. But it's because the air conditioning and the sun, it dries out your skin and it can make that mark more visible at certain times than others. Some of the ulama have said that the person who intentionally tries to put their head on the floor with the pressure to make this mark appear, then this is something that can be considered an act of riya, meaning showing off. So it was seen as, seen as, as, as something that is detested or makruh in Islam, if that is the niyyah. The second group of ulama, of course, they said that if this is a natural sign, and not out of vain, vain glory, somebody trying to make it happen, trying to show off or to make this as a, a mark of ostentation or to say, I pray longer or more than you, then this is something that is forgiven. Finally, one of the signs of the khawarij, of those who rebelled against the Prophet and the Sahaba, were those who used to do this. They used to put their head on the ground and mark it so that it would show that they were extra worshippers. And therefore, that mark was actually seen in that era of the Sahaba as something that this distinguished people who went to excessiveness and were trying to show that they were more prayery, more prayerful, more uh, obedient to Allah than others. Now, alhamdulillah, from the question that you ask and the way you ask it, I can sense in your heart a sincerity to Allah. I can sense in your heart that you were hurt by the words that were conveyed. Perhaps it was misunderstood in how our dear brother, may Allah forgive us and him, whoever it may be, the way he answered, it, it may have come to your heart in a way that he did not intend or she did not intend. I ask you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. Don't we wish for Allah to forgive us all? So if the brother has made this mistake and has said something wrong, Please do forgive him, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive and hide all of our mistakes. We return to that ayah that we were studying in the very early part of Surah Al-Anfal. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ That their hearts find an awe, a fear, a trembling before their, the majesty of Allah. وَإِذَا تُلِّيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِمَانًا and when the verses, the signs of Allah are recited upon them, in some of ulama, they said signs are recited upon them for the first time. It's the first time they heard this verse from the Quran. The first time they heard this explanation of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The first time they experienced something that reminded them of Allah. It's their first occasion to hear this particular tafsir or this particular ayah. Zadatun imana. It increased them in faith. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us the reason for people increasing in faith. And may Allah make you and I of those who when something strikes us, when a verse is recited, a page is read, an exhortation or a, a recommendation is given, when a sunnah is taught to us, when something is shown to us as a sign from Allah, that it takes our breath away and our iman rises. Now, of course, in that is an important point of aqidah. The aqidah is our adherence to the word of Allah. We will maintain it and look after it as we maintain our calls with our viewers who are online. We have two callers waiting. We'll begin with the first caller. Assalamu alaikum, caller. How can I help? Yes, sister. Sorry you were cut off. I know you had a second question. I apologize for that. So what I would 
recommend for something that's such a detailed question, surely there would be one of the senior scholars in your locality. I'm hopeful, inshallah, that you live in an area where, alhamdulillah, they're learned amongst you in the United Kingdom or in one of the areas in, um, you know, uh, in your locality that you can sit with them and have them go through a matrix with you. I would never tell you on, as, a, as a, a knee-jerk reaction, sell it and whatever happens, happens. That isn't the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are meant to protect our initial seed investment. We are not seeking to increase and to have a gluttonous uh, you know, uh, increase in our wealth at the detriment of our others. But what I will say to you, my dear sister, is that if there are other mechanisms, if there are other opportunities for you to leverage finance, maybe from family or others, to be a little bit more creative. And it might be that you sit with a financial consultant, a non-Muslim financial consultant, who can work wonders in finding you ways to kind of come out of these penalizing uh, contractual obligations. I know, and I know others who I've assisted with this locally here, who are able to kind of find the mechanism to break free of what they felt in their heart was not right for them to be in, after uh, arising in, uh, and, and arising in their faith with that regard. But certainly it should not be an instantaneous knee-jerk reaction. It shouldn't just be something where you say, I'm going to leave it and whatever whatever may uh, be, may be. We have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum caller, how can I help? Assalamu alaikum caller. Assalamu alaikum. Next caller, We can take the next caller, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum caller. For the one who missed us, please call back, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum caller. How can I help? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa My question is uh, as I'm aware that you're not allowed to do the nothing after after Asalam, but if we go to the mosque after Asalam, are they allowed to do the message? Allah be better. Yes. And my, my other question is like, if I'm doing tawaf between Asr and Baghdad, are we, are we are, am I allowed to do the tawaf um, after I finish my tawaf? Jazakallah. Of course, another third question. Ashallah. Uh, if I'm doing a tahajjid prayer of prayer, can I hold my mushaf and read any surah? Allah be better. All right. I will try to remember all three questions, inshallah. The first two are very similar to each other. So there are prohibited, uh, and I use the word prohibited in a very loose manner. The words of the Prophet, وسلم, for some ulama, they indicated that it was undesirable to pray in front of other people who would assume that as we're praying at that moment, that it was because the sun setting. And some people, they see it, they say, oh, are these people worshipping the sun? So there are some ulama who said that if you are in a place where it is only amongst the Muslims, only amongst the righteous, you're praying in your own home, then it's not something that has the prohibition, although it is undesirable. What I will say to you is, when you enter the masjid, it is better for you not to pray tahiyyatul masjid. It is not wrong, it is not a sin to sit in the masjid before praying. It is highly desirable. And Allah is the one who rewards us on account of our niyyah, on account of the niyyah that we have for doing a good deed that we are not able to do it for that particular purpose. I know that one of my teachers, and it was just maybe five minutes before the Adhan of Bethlehem. And sometimes you see brothers still doing this, and we always, I always engage brothers who are standing. So they come to the masjid five minutes before the adhan. So they remain standing, waiting for the adhan rather than sitting down. And I remember as I was standing next to my teacher, he pulled my juba and he said, sit down. I said, oh, Sheikh, I haven't, I didn't get a chance to pray uh, the tahiyya. He goes, sit. The purpose of it is a recommendation, is not that it is sinful for you to sit if there is an inexcusable reason. The third question you asked about holding the mushaf. There is dispute amongst the ulama from very early generations. We know that there is evidence in the life of Aisha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, that one of her uh, young servants and aides 
used to have a Quran that was placed in front of him that he would lead her in prayer by reading from it. Although the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa is very strict, that we should not do anything that is outside the routines of salah. They're the only ones who really have that committed strictness that they can see it if somebody is actually doing something beyond the dictates of salah that it can take away from the reward and even may ruin the salah. My opinion, wallahu ta'ala a'lam, is that of the jumhur, the majority opinion, that it is valid to have a Quran that one reads from. It is better not to hold it in one's hand. It can be placed on a bench or on a chair or on a table next to you. And that you are to read from it the section that is going to assist you in that. In fact, we have as, as people who have him as a way to re revise the Quran in our tahajjud, we have al-mushaf al tahajjud, where every page is a quarter of the juz. So in four pages, you finish the juz. May Allah accept it from all of us. Allahumma ameen. We have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum caller. How can I help? Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah khair for asking. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is uh, the ayah, Surah al Rahma. Yes. Tabarakas, Mukkar, Rabbika, Nijalan, the Quran. Yes. And this one, if you've got a liver problem, you can recite it daily, a glow of water. And let the patient go. Okay. So, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to try to have very hard to find a connection. Why just for liver? This I just for liver problem or the other problems? Can you elaborate it? Jazakallah khair. Um, uh, thank you for your question, my dear, uh, my dear uncle. Uh, the Quran in its entirety is seen as a source of spiritual purification. It is also seen as a tool for healing. Now, there's a difference between healing and medicine. And sometimes when we are seeking to read with the Quran, we should not mistake it as a medicine in the sense that we leave off our medical procedures and other things. So the healing of the Quran it can have a spiritual and a physical effect on us. Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyimi says one of the first ways the Ummah abandoned the Quran, turned away from the Book of Allah, is that we don't use it for healing. And there are certain places in the Quran that the Prophet used to recite for certain ailments and certain things. So what we know of is Surah Al-Fatiha was recited for pains. We know that قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ for aches and for feeling of, of uh, dehydration and tiredness. There were certain surahs. There is no mention in the authentic sunnah about a particular ayah other than Ayatul Kursi, I used as a spiritual medicine by the Prophet ﷺ. Now, with this particular verse, it is probably mintajruba. One of the ulama may have recommended to a student and it had a good effect. I cannot recommend it, but I will not denounce it as well. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. I hope you will join me after our short break when we return back for part two. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes. All right, Salaamu Alaikum. For those of you who are listening along on my social media, on Instagram, on YouTube, and Facebook, I can happy to take some of your questions through that, inshallah. So I'll turn my attention to the Instagram feed that's in front of me here. Uh, we try to always keep busy until we come back online with our satellite channel, with Islam channel. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us um, useful to others. Allahumma ameen. So for those of you who are on Instagram, I'll, I'll look through. Let's see if we can uh, uh, we are, we can receive any questions or we've received any questions, inshallah. Lots of waves and salams and salam alaikum. All right. Uh, So we have a question from one of the sisters where she says that about a week before the menstrual cycle arrives, that there is a necessity to kind of be in a seated position and to stretch. Uh, it helps them kind of relieve some of that. Uh, is this okay? So if the seated position in the salah is in, is in the same habit of the sunnah of the Prophet 
then it's accepted. If it's outside salah, then yes, you are willing to sit in whatever way is going to provide you comfort, inshallah. But you should not sit in a way that is opposite to the tradition and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ unless there is a genuine reason for not being able to fulfill the iftirash or uh, the tawarruq or, or the, the, the habit of how the Prophet ﷺ sat in his particular mode uh, of prayer. All right. Let's see if there are any other questions that are coming through. Jazakumullah khair. All right. Here we go. It, are there two opinions to pray Fajr? What is the beginning time? It's not about two opinions. It's that there is a true Fajr, which is the very first rays or the very first explosion. And that's where the word Fajr comes from. Uh, that right before that is the beginning time of Fajr. And of course, when it comes to calendars and estimates, it will range in scholarly opinions. So there's a delineation of the the sighting and, and things of that nature. And the best thing to do is to kind of take a look at the masajid of your locality. And I know in the United Kingdom, there's a huge divergence. In southern and northern regions, there is a huge diversion of it. What I would recommend is um, take the, the opinion of the masjid that you have trusted in their scholarship, in their ulama, and that they are not on their own in a far off kind of, uh, you know, far right or far left. Try to find what the majority of the people of your town, of your city are doing, and that will lead you to the best of courses and outcome. And it is a matter of ishtihad. May Allah reward you. Allahumma ameen. What does it mean when you see the moon and the other star looking things glowing through one eye in your dream? MashaAllah. All right, so dreams are of different types. There are three main types of dreams. There is the dream that is from the shaytan, and this is the words of the Prophet ﷺ. And there is a dream which is hadith of nafs, that your soul is expressing itself, it's releasing tension. So, for example, you had a hard day at work, you were just, you know, uh, things were being piled up on you. So, in your sleep, you feel that you're falling, or you feel that you're on a force and it's running so quickly and you can't bring it under control. That's your soul kind of expressing itself. Then the third type of dream is not an imaginary. It's not from the shaitan. It is a vision. And it foretells through symbols, through events, through colors. And there's a matrix of 14 different things. You can return to an article or a set of articles that I wrote, The Art of Islamic Dream Interpretation. You'll find it on Muslim Matters. Or if you just Google Yahya Ibrahim Dream Interpretation, I have a number of talks on YouTube that kind of go into detail with that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it of value. Now, what I do remind you of is try never to interpret a dream in a negative scenario. The Prophet wasallam says that a dream is a, it's, it's, a, it's as if it is attached to the wing of a bird, to the leg of a bird. And if you try to catch it, if you interpret it in one way, it'll fall as you think it will fall. So be careful of how you interpret dreams. In fact, the Prophet وسلم, this where an incident occurred with his wife, a woman came and asked the Prophet وسلم, a question. She saw a dream and she, you know, Aisha didn't know who this woman, what does she want with my husband? وسلم, and eventually the Prophet listens to the dream and he interprets it in a positive way. The woman comes back a while later. She says, I have a dream for the Prophet وسلم, to interpret. And Aisha says, he's not here. Tell me what it is and I'll tell you. So she tells Aisha, and Aisha interpreted it in a way that was not positive. And in both occasions, the dream could have been positive, but one was interpreted in a way that brought about a negative um, happening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us khayran barakallahu ameen. We're going to return back to our live feed. Jazakallah khayr for your questions. You're welcome to call in through Islam channel, inshallah. All right, I mean, I'm with you again in the studio, brother. Jazakallah khair. Allahumma salli ala. Bismillah.
All right, we'll be going live shortly, inshallah. Rejoining the stream now. One minute, one minute. Thank you. All right, let's see. Maybe we can take another question quickly, inshallah. As a woman, when we perform salah, can we read the surah loud in our salah? Yes, sister, jazakallah khair. You are permitted to read the surah loud, not loud that it's uh, you know disturbing to others. So whether you're in your own home or other places, you are permitted to articulate the Quran. It's something that can be heard by you, inshallah. All right. There was a little bit of barakah there before we begin. All right, we got 20 seconds before we begin, inshallah. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa ba'd. To your brother Yahya Ibrahim coming to you once again live through Islam Channel from my home here in Perth, Western Australia. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you khayr and barakah wherever you are in the world. You are given the opportunity, alhamdulillah, to phone in to Islam Channel to be live on with, with me live on air with your questions. May Allah make us useful to each other. Allahumma ameen. We were speaking about the importance of Iman and the raising of Iman. We said that as a part of our aqidah, the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah, the people who believe in the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu who hold on to the book of Allah and the tradition of the Nabi, is that we believe Iman yazidu bil ta'a wa yamutu bil ma'asiyah. Iman increases with obedience and decreases with silkiness. SubhanAllah, we have five callers on the line. We'll try to go through them, inshallah, and continue our discussion if Allah gives us the energy and the time. Allah Mabi. Our first caller, Assalamu alaikum caller, how can I help? Yes, my brother. Uh, the first one is regarding Surah. Uh, I was reading the translation of Surah, but I couldn't understand. Uh, it's regarding this room with the Eclipse uh, revealed something related to that. Just a little bit explaining about that. And second, uh, when I'm doing the Hajj, do I have to postpone my return to do with the Hajj, or I can do with the Isha and then after? Surah Al-Rum is one of the blessed surahs of the Qur'an. It has a very particular reason for being revealed to the Prophet The Roman Empire uh, was a Christian empire. The Byzantine Empire was a Christian empire. And therefore, there is a greater affinity amongst the people of Islam with the people of the book. While the people of Quraysh who lived at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they had an alliance with the people of Persia, who were those who were not a people of the book. So when the Persians defeated the Byzantians, there was this great um, joy that occurred amongst the people of Quraysh. So Allah subhanahu and there was this sadness that occurred amongst the people of Islam. And this kind of shows you that we can find strength and find happiness for those who may not agree and believe in everything that we believe in, but we see them as allies in many other aspects. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The, the Byzantine Empire were defeated in this battle, but within a few years, Bid'a in the Arabic language means under 10 and over three. So between three to nine years, that they will resurge and recapture their glory and defeat the Persian army. And the people of Quraysh, each and every month and year, they would ridicule the Prophet ﷺ and the people of Islam or try to. Nabi ﷺ is the noble, ennobled, honorable one. Peace and blessings be upon him. They would try to bring down their spirit and say, where is this Quran? Where is this you're foretelling? Where is this prophecy that you have? Until finally, the defeat of the Persian Empire and the hands of the Byzantians was assured. With regards to your second question about praying your wits early in the night and then wanting to pray to Hajjah before your Fajr in the morning, this isn't something that is strange and has not occurred at the top of 
the time of the Prophet In fact, the Prophet وسلم, he taught us that we should not have two wits in one night. Meaning that if you prayed Salatul Isha and you felt yourself tired and you didn't know, you weren't sure if you're going to wake up early, early before Fajr, then it is better for you to pray your Shafa'a and Watra or your final Witra prayer. And if Allah gives you an inspiration, a strength, that you wake up, then just carry along and pray your two rak'ah again. You don't go back and worry about that. So your witra has been prayed for the night. Pray another two rak'ah. There is nothing invalid in that, inshallah. In the Prophet saying, delay the witra, it is so that we are honoring to Allah, recommending for us to pray in the evening. Peace and blessings be upon him. Alayhi abdullah salawa atamun taslim. I have another caller. Assalamu alaikum caller. How can I help? Sure. I'm continually always uh, contemplating and uh, have uh, dilemma that uh, people are always talking about um, once you obviously the birth is temporary and uh, once you pass away, the best sadhgar uh, that Jaliya is for to have by his children and um, they're all going along with long, the good deeds that the children do. Now, for, like for myself, um, I don't have children. Um, and uh, through a lot of will, um, I don't have children. And uh, I, I know at the end of the day, any miracle can happen. I'm in my 40s now, but still, there's plenty of women who don't have children. So and I some of the best women, women in the world. Women. And I want you to remember, some of the greatest women in the world, Aisha, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, did not have a child with the Nabi Sallallahu And Aisha is the greatest fiqh advisor after the life of the Prophet Aisha was, you know, Aisha is known as Rajula. She exceeded the capacity of the men of her time in her wisdom, in her teaching. And, you know, the challenge that you have, my dear sister, and I'm sorry for interrupting your, your, your discussion, but I, I felt compelled to just say to you, you know, one of the greatest honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon you is that there is a challenge that you face that you know is there. Some people have been given children, but they become an insurmountable challenge for them. Allah gives us the story in Surah Al-Kahf that there were those, a father and mother, who were blessed with a male child, but who was going to be unruly later on in life, that Allah sends Al-Khidr and Prophet Musa to the point that Al-Khidr causes the death of this child because Allah wants to protect the iman of the father and mother and will re-gift them a daughter instead. So I want you to know that, you know, having the child for the purpose where we seek nearness to Allah and to add value to the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ is a noble pursuit and your reward is given even just with your niya. But know that the challenges at times that maybe you have in not having that child and your heart desired it for wanting to please Allah, that that may be your gateway to Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suffice you and protect you and assist you and ennoble you and assist you to recognize your purpose in life and the goodness you can bring it and how you may be useful to others. One of the Quran teachers of my teachers one of the people in my chain of narration, two chains back, is a woman who, you know, she is the teacher of some of the great Qur'an, some of the great reciters. And she never had any children. And she said near the end of her life, she said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored me, favored me that I was not occupied with my own children, that I was able to teach this so that the children of the Ummah, the Prophet sallallahu may have this Qur'an as a legacy for me to them. So I want you to look at it as a great opportunity as well for you, my dear sister. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and ennoble you and assist you. Allahumma ameen. We have another caller on the line. As-salamu alaykum caller. Assalamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, I have a question if you could please. Yes, my brother. Only in Ramadan, please, if you could just explain. The, the Prophet wasallam, he said that the one who performs Umrah in Ramadan 
it is as if they have performed Hajj. And in one narration, as if they have performed Hajj with the Prophet And of course, this advice of the Prophet was to be, you know, uh, you know, give this great hope of the believers making that journey in the month of Ramadan. It's a month where you want to make i'tikaf, and what greater i'tikaf than in the house of Allah that was first built for the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us uh, a standing in the month of Ramadan in his blessed land, near Al-Ka'b al-Musharrafa al-Mukarrama, Allahumma ameen. May Allah accept it from us. Uh, one of the things that the Prophet sallam, he says, uh, Hajj after Hajj and Umrah after Umrah leave a person sinless when they return to Allah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who are regular in our return to Umrah after Umrah and Hajj after Hajj. Abdullah ibn Umar, anhu, the son of Umar al-Khattab, one of the greatest followers of the Prophet Sunnah, Abdullah ibn Umar, anhu, he performed 60 Hajj year after year. And the first Hajj he performed with, with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The great Imam of Hadith, Sufyan al-Thawri, he performed also 60 Hajj year after year. So if one has been blessed with wealth, May Allah carry them again for Hajj. May Allah carry them again for Umrah. And may Allah return us many more times. Ameen. We have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum caller. How can I help? Yes, my brother. share it how do we divide it what is the the dis the distribution sorry there were moments where your phone call kind of uh you know missed due to the connection so i'm, I'm going to take myself yes okay yes yes ma'am Yes. We know you know that the place you have this, the place you have this father, mother, and sister, they won't keep any surprise. Yes. But what within what period? How long after the after the period can you be carried out? Oh, how long should it be before we do the the, the distribution? Okay, Jazakallah Khair. I understand that now. Allah barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. So I will rephrase the, uh, the, the, the question of our brother. The brother says, when a Muslim passes away, we know we have our Sharia distribution of inheritance laws. And these are very specific for our parents, for our children, for our spouse or spouses, uh, for those who are um, young and those who are old. All of this is categorized in Islam. How soon should we execute this? Now, the ulama are of a difference of opinion. Is it something that should be done in a particular period of time, or is it open according to the needs of the family? So for a, in certain cultures, for example, it's done after 40 days. In other cultures, it's done after 30 days. In other cultures, it's even done on the day when there are needs, such as repaying a debt or making sure that the estate is given um, and that the share of those who are waiting on something that is necessary be provided for them. And they take different rulings for this. So what I would say, my dear brother, is in the area that you live in, in the culture that you find yourself, the Islamic culture that you find yourself, I would want you to go with the norms of the society of Muslims that are with you. You don't want to do something that may upset the sensibilities of other people, that they might think you're delaying the distribution because you're saying, no, we're going to wait 40 days or, or, or as in other cultures, if your culture is in three days. So do what is the norm of your locality and your culture, inshallah. And this is something that can be guided to you by the ulama. And if you are living in an area where there is Islamic uh, tribunals, 
and an opportunity for the ulama to assist you in this, I highly recommend that this is something to be done, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. We have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum, caller. Wa alaikum salam. Sorry, now. No problem, my brother. Uh, yeah, inshallah. So, I've got uh, two quick, two quick questions. One is, uh, if the food macro is I've had it, uh, you know, the most food, to eat the seafood, most food, I really like them, and it's for growth, I uh, said, it's for growth. So, by consuming, it's, it's not the hara, but it's for growth. So, when do I attend uh, in this? All right. So uh, the food of the sea, the food of the sea in general is seen as halal. So anything that lives exclusively in the sea, even if it is a predator animal, because all fish consume other fish. If it is something that lives exclusively in the sea and dies when you take it out, dies when you take it out, there is very little dispute amongst the ulama. Where there is dispute are with things like crustaceans, shrimp and mussels, things that can live outside the water for a period of time and then when returned can resume normal function or they can live on land and on water with equal, with equal ease. It is a very narrow dis dis uh, distinction amongst the people who follow the madhab of Imam of Hanifa. They see that these are crustaceans that should not be eaten while the majority opinion is that they are valid because they are known as seafood. So if you look at it from a linguistic sense, if people look at something and they call this, you know, um, something that is ta'am, that is, is the food from the ocean, from the sea, things like sea cucumbers and, you know, some of the, uh, uh, some of the plants of it and some of the crustaceans of it, most of the ulama, the majority of opinion that it is permissible to eat and valid to eat. There is a minority view and a respected minority view that holds the opinion it is better not to eat it because it's not entirely a sea creature because it can live and breathe out of the land. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. I will leave it up to your discretion, inshallah. Whatever, you know, I would not want you to serve a plate of mussels in your home if everybody there is following the opinion that this is invalid. Now, it might be that on the odd occasion, mashallah, that you do get some chili mussels on your own and you enjoy them knowing that it is not a sinful behavior. It's not something that's haram in that sense, inshallah. But certainly it shouldn't be forced upon others within your community, within your household, if they see it as something that they uh, that is detestable. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. We have another caller, I believe, on the line. Assalamu alaikum caller. Oh, jazakallah khair. So alhamdulillah, we've gone through a number of callers there. Let's get back to Surah Al-Amthal. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَجِنَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْ الْإِيمَانِ Back to your WhatsApp question. Our, our Iman increases, our Iman increases when our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, is fulfilled. Now, I want it to be something that we kind of finish this point before we, we move on to some of our new incoming questions, inshallah. Iman increases with good deeds and it can decrease by not doing the same good deeds. So that's important. So the drop of Iman or the drop of our commitment and practice uh, after the month of Ramadan is very natural. It's not only something condemnable. And I don't want, you know, that, uh, that concept. Sometimes you will even hear some of our learned brothers and sisters say, oh, this person, he exerted himself in Ramadan and now they're forgetting about Allah outside Ramadan. It's not that we're forgetting Allah, is that it is a natural circumstance in life that we were fasting and going to Taraweeh and giving charity and subhanAllah that's come to an end, naturally has come to an end. And we want to recapture it, so we try to fast in the month of Shawwal and after Shawwal and make up any missed prayers that we have. All of that is praiseworthy. So know that there is a dip in Iman when we do not contain and maintain the same level of good deeds, it's a natural process. But also, we can go below the line if we now increase in sinful behavior. So it's not just now that I'm not doing the same good deeds that I did or the voluntary good deed, but now I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing that eats away from Iman. 
One of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that we should hear more often of is the Prophet وسلم, said, Iman becomes worn out, becomes tarnished. The way your clothing becomes worn out with repeated use and washing. So the more I wear this, the more I wash it, the more the fabric becomes worn out. It doesn't have its same luster as when it was first bought. And the Prophet says, Iman in your heart tarnishes in the same way that your fabric will torture. So what's the cure? فَسَلُّ So ask Allah. And you جَدِّدَ الْإِمَانَ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Ask Allah to rejuvenate, reignite, reestablish, recommit, reconsolidate Iman in your heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow Iman to grow in our heart. I want to end in our last minute by making dua for myself and you. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts our previous month of Ramadan, that Allah accepted it, our fasting and our charity and those of us who gave our zakat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our walking and riding to the taraweeh and the masjid. May Allah give us many more Ramadan in good health and with our families. Allahumma ameen. Wa salli allahumma ala Sayyidina Muhammad. I look forward to seeing you again next week, 12 o'clock, noon time in London. Your brother Yahya Ibrahim. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma taqabbal minna. Allahumma taqabbal minna. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.